Good morning. I'm Debbie Hasdorf, and I'm the pastor here at Parkview United Church of Christ in White Bear Lake, Minnesota. And on behalf of the congregation um, scattered in at home and also a few of us here, I want to welcome you to worship at Parkview. Whoever you are, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I just have one announcement to make today, <clears throat> and that is that um, we are planning a worship service outdoors on August the 30th. Um, it's going to be a special service because it's um, Confirmation Sunday. It's the Sunday that we have six young people who are um, joining our church, um, choosing to um, adopt for themselves the, the name Christian. And so um, I invite you to join us at that service. We're really excited about it and hoping that a lot of you will be there to support our confirmants. So that's my announcement. So now let's begin with prayer. Merciful God, we confess that like Jesus' disciples, we too sometimes lose patience with people who need our help and support. Like the disciples, we find ourselves wishing that they would just go away and leave us in peace. In your mercy, forgive us. Remind us again of the deep love you showed towards us when we were still in need. A love so deep that you willingly sent your son to the cross on our behalf. Show us how to love others as you have loved us. Teach us your compassion so that we may be your hands and feet to those in need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn this morning is called, Lord, I Want to Be a Christian. And Heather Cogswell is going to play and sing that for us. And we invite you to sing along at home if you'd like. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart, in my heart, in my heart. Lord, I want to be a Christian in my heart. Lord, I want to be in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, in my heart, in my heart, Lord, I want to be more loving in my heart, Lord, I want to be like Jesus in my heart, in my heart.
Our scripture lesson today is from Matthew chapter 15, verses 21 through 28. And I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. It's called The Canaanites' Woman's Faith. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting at us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. And she said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus answered, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. I have always loved this story. It's a story about a spunky woman who convinces Jesus to change his mind. And it's a story about a very human Jesus who allows his exhaustion and his prejudices to knee-jerk him onto an unkind and unfaithful response to a desperate mother. So let's take a minute and start by looking at the passage for today. If you remember from last week, Jesus has received the news of the killing of John the Baptist. He has fed 5,000 people with five loaves and two fishes. He has withdrawn to grieve and ponder and pray and recenter himself. Then he walks across the stormy waters of the Sea of Galilee, scares the disciples nearly to death, and proves to Peter that he is the Son of God. Next, he gets into a spat with the Pharisees about the need to wash your hands before you eat. Good, good thing to do in the COVID season. So it's safe to assume that by the time Jesus crosses paths with the woman from Cana, Canaan, he is exhausted and maybe even a little bit fed up. His best friend and his cousin has been killed. 50,000, 5,000 hungry people were demanding food from loaves and fishes. He needed a break to process his loss and his grief. And then he needed to explain over and over and over again to his disciples and especially to Peter who he was and what he had come to do. And he himself, it seems, was just beginning to understand, truly understand his burden, his fate, his calling, his purpose. So when this this woman, the Greek word is squawking, when this squawking, insistent persistent mother, a mother who clearly is not going to take no for an answer. Mothers of sick children are like that. When this squawking mother almost assaults him with her cries, and when she says to him, have mercy on me, my daughter is possessed and suffering terribly, it's not hard to understand why it is he speaks harshly to her. And Jesus isn't only dismissive of her, he's actually even a little bit mean. I was only sent, he says, to the lost sheep of Israel. I can't help everyone. There is only so much of me to go around. There are so many demands, so many people, so much suffering. What am I to do? I've got my hands full with these disciples and these Pharisees and the Roman oppressors. What more can I do? I just can't do it all. And she's a foreigner. She's a woman. Is she my problem too? I can only focus. I only have enough for my own people, the people of Israel. What is it that you want me to do here anyway? And then there's the kick to the gut. It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to the dog. In the time of Jesus, dogs were not often pets. 
never pets amongst the peasant class. They were considered dirty little scavengers, only necessary to hunt or to protect the garden. Dogs were annoying, persistent scavengers. And so when Jesus calls her a dog, a little female dog, it's only her, it can only be heard as an insult. And as a desperate mother, she will not take no for an answer. She cannot take no for an answer. She reaches deep down into her courage and her quick mind and her love for her daughter. And she looks Jesus straight in the eye, unblinking, and she shoots back. Even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And Jesus, taken aback, looks her back straight in the eye, toe to toe, heart to heart. And he says, woman, you have great faith. What you have asked for, you will be given. And in that moment, her daughter was healed. It's a powerful little story, important enough to be included in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I want to reflect on this story from the perspective of the two voices that we hear in this story, the voices of Jesus and the Canaanite woman. The Canaanite woman was remarkable because in the grand scheme of things, she was a person who really didn't matter. She was a woman, she was poor, she was not a Jew. She was a Canaanite, a Greek, a foreigner. She was a woman alone talking to a man in public in a place in, in so she didn't understand she was a woman talking to a man in public so she didn't understand her place in the world the rules that she was supposed to be following she was a mother with a sca a strange scary child so no one expected jesus to pay attention to her she didn't matter to them so she shouldn't matter so much to him but the amazing part of this story is how this spunky, persistent, tenacious, smart woman decided that she was going to speak up. In a room where she was not seen or even recognized, she put on her big girl pants and spoke her truth. Even the dog, she said, get the crumbs that drop from the master's table. We live in a world where it can be dangerous, it can be risky to speak up. When you cross the line and you dare to disagree, the temperature in the room changes. When you speak truth to power, the lights dim and you are standing in a spotlight. When you claim your voice, your rights, your claim, or you claim your airtime or your space, you can expect a reaction. You can expect that there's going to be pushback. Speaking up carries a price. When you are brave enough, brave enough to claim who you are, what you believe, and what you know to be right or wrong, you are inviting trouble. And that is what is so remarkable about this Canaanite mother. She invited trouble. John Lewis, um, American treasure who we lost just a couple of weeks ago, has this famous quote that just speaks to this idea of speaking and causing trouble. He says, do not get lost in a sea of despair, like that Canaanite woman. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never, ever be afraid to make some noise and to get into good trouble, necessary trouble. We live in a world that tells us, especially those people who are not in power, who have little control, tells them to be quiet and to let it go. You are not smart enough or educated enough or pretty enough or right enough or faithful enough or brave enough to speak up. Because if you speak up, you fear you will pay a price. So it's better to shut up to sit down, or to let it go. But there's always a moment when you just can't do it, when you can't sit down, you can't shut up. And you have to ask yourself, what is the price of staying quiet? 
If the cost is your sick daughter, you speak up. If the cost is a hundred of innocent black lives, you speak up. If the cost is the repudiation of the, your values, your country, your truths, you speak up. If, you, if what you see or witness or cannot shut your eyes to is just so not right, you speak up. There are times to be quiet and to go away. There are times when to be quiet and to go away costs more than the price of speaking up. And so you cannot not speak up. And this is the truth of the Canaanite mother. But the other voice that we hear coming loud and clear through the words of this scripture is the voice of Jesus. Is it not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs? Jesus is being a jerk. Now, we don't like to think of Jesus as being a jerk. He is the son of God, after all. Instead of judging her by her need and having compassion for her, he sees her only as a foreigner and he ignores her. And then he insults her. The question this story asks us to consider is do we need Jesus to be perfect, to be fully God in order to follow him? Can we allow ourselves to see Jesus being unkind and unloving and even mean? Can we consider the possibility that Jesus learned, learned during the time of his ministry? That he grows and learns and develops as a human being. In this little story, the Canaanite mother calls Jesus on his sinfulness and challenges him to learn and to grow. And he sees himself reflected in her eyes through her pain and through her suffering and through her injustice. And he allows himself to be changed. And if Jesus, if Jesus can learn and grow, if Jesus can be transformed by looking into the mirror in her eyes, why can't we? Learning and growing and changing is Christ-like. We can ask ourselves, as Jesus did, who are we ignoring? What are the dogs we would rather not deal with, rather not be challenged by? Jesus stopped dead in his tracks at the truth in her words. And he listened, and he changed, and he was transformed. In her words, Jesus became aware of his own culturally inherited prejudices. He understood Jews to be children of God, not dogs. Jesus was a Jew, and as a white male Jew, he had privileges, advantages that were invisible to him. She called him out. Just like black Americans are calling us out today on our blindness and our suffering. Racism is such a part of the very fabric of our history and of our present that it has become dangerous not to see it or to deny it. When Jesus' eyes are opened to his own prejudices and his own hurtfulness, he is a model for us about how it, what it means to listen, to consider our own souls, and to repent. How to seek forgiveness and reconciliation, and how to be healed and made new. This little story, this beautiful little story, is about being brave enough to speak your truth. Being open enough to truly listen when someone tells you their truth. It's about being willing to consider your own responsibility for injustice and suffering and being strong enough to make changes in your own life when you understand. Maya Angelou is famous for these words that just ring so true when I hear the scripture. Do the best you can until you know better. Then when you know better, do better. Isn't that what's happening in this story? That's what is happening with Jesus. I think that knowing that Jesus could be a jerk allows me to know how I can respond when I am being a jerk. 
and owning up to our jerkiness or our sinfulness or our mistakes or our bad choices is possible because we know that our Savior, the one who most closely aligned his will with the will of God, was transformed through his willingness to recognize his limits and his missteps and be challenged and changed. Go forth and do likewise. Amen. This is the time in our service when we stop and we listen to our hearts. Sometimes I feel like across the air we can feel each other's hearts beating, our, our concerns and our cares going up to God together. So we're going to stop for a few minutes and listen to some prayer concerns that were sent into the church this week. Um, Phil and Sylvia Schaetzel called and asked for prayers for their granddaughter Susan, who's, who was in a coma at United Hospital with COVID. And I was really happy to get a call from Phil last night saying that um, after 12 days on a ventilator, um, Susan has come off the ventilator and she's doing okay. It's going to be a long, long recovery, but they are so thankful that she's off the ventilator and breathing for herself. So um, we'll light a blue candle, a prayer of thanksgiving that Susan is off the ventilator and is on a path to recovery. 
Mary Ross has a sister named Laura who's undergoing tests for uterine and lung cancer. And she asks that we remember Laura in prayer. So prayers for Laura. Laura, we hold you in the light of Christ. Um, the, uh, the Woodridges asked for prayers for a friend and classmate of Becca, their youngest daughter. And her name is Julie Rossini, and she has stage four breast cancer. And she, um, she's in hospice care, and, got, and the doctors have given her two days to two weeks. She has two children. And um, the update is, is that Julia has passed away. So prayers for Julia, prayers of thanksgiving that she's beyond pain and suffering and is in the arms of God. And prayers for her children, for her family, her spouse, for all the people who love her and who are walking the pathway of grief. So for Julia, for all those who loved her, for Becca, we hold you in the light of Christ. And then um, Catherine Coomer um, asked that we lift, light a candle for all of the people in Iowa, especially for the farmers who um, had terrible storms this week. Many, many of them lost their crops. And being a farmer is a very hard life, and you are totally at the mercy of the weather. And so this will be a time of, um, of loss, of struggle, and of rebuilding. So for the farmers and all the people in Iowa who experienced loss this week, we hold you in the light of Christ. And then like we do every week, um, we lift up all the people in the world whose lives are impacted by the COVID virus. Um, the people who, um, who are sick with the virus, the people who have loved ones who are sick with the virus, people who are working in hospitals and in so many different ways in our world right now to bring healing and safety to people who are sick. Um, and then for all the people who are afraid, um, who are um, afraid of COVID, afraid for their families, we pray for them. For all the people whose um, economic lives, whose jobs and, and well, their economic well-being has been affected by the virus. We cannot control the virus, and that is very frightening. And so we pray that God will show us the small steps that we can take to try to stop the virus, halt the virus, um, sit keep each other and keep our world safe. And we ask that um, God in his wisdom will reveal to our scientists and our doctors and all the people who are working um, to find a vaccine, God will reveal to, to them the way forward. So for all the lives in this whole wide world that are affected by the COVID virus, we hold you in the light of Christ. And then for our brothers and sisters who are... Um, black Americans and people of color, we want to pray for them again that now that, um, now that the initial um, surge is over, that many of them are afraid that, um, that we are returning to a life of complacency about the reality of racism. And so um, I want us to lift, up, um, lift them up and lift ourselves up as we all ask God's wisdom and guidance and God's courage as we um, seek to face some hard truths about ourselves and some hard truths about the way we thought the world worked. And we pray for those people who knew all along that the world was broken and who we didn't believe. So for all the lives that are touched by racism, we hold you in the light of Christ. And then one more finally for our country. Um, it, I don't know about you, but it feels um, as if we are more divided than ever, that um, the problems that we have are so deep that we, and that we cannot find a path forward together. And so I ask for God's healing for our broken country, um, for all the lives that are impacted by um, our inability to work together, for all the people in the world who need our leadership and our support and our generosity, who... Um, who cannot find that now in a time in which we are so focused on ourselves and on our own conflict. So prayers for, um, for all of us that we might find a way to move forward together, that we might find a way to remember that each person, um, like us, different than us, of the same political persuasion or not, they're all beloved children of God and that they are the way they are um, because of their lives, life experience, and that it is 
our calling to see God's face in their face. So for all of us, for our country, and for the people of our country, that we might find ways to live together in peace. We hold you in the light of Christ. Let us be together in prayer. Loving God, sometimes you seem far away, distant. We wonder whether you walk here beside us. When our problems seem so deep, when our, the things that divide us seem so significant, we reach for a higher power to bring us together, to give us wisdom, to show us how to go forward. Remind us, O oh God, that we are called to speak truth, to speak up, to call out the places in our lives where injustice is happening. Remind us that our voices matter, that we have a truth, each of us, to speak, and that our voices can be strong enough to be heard. And we also ask that we might be, like Jesus, open to looking at our own lives and our own choices and that we might be willing to listen, to listen with open hearts and to, to truly hear the experience of someone else, to recognize when our choices are affecting other people, when we are causing pain through what we do. Remind us that like Jesus, we can accept the fact that we are imperfect, that we are flawed, that we make mistakes because we know that you are working through us and that you redeem our mistakes and make something new. And we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, that brings us to the end of our service. And again, I'm so thankful that you are with us. Um, it just makes me think of the miracle of the internet, that we are all connected um, through, through the power of the internet. So um, wherever you are, we are thinking about you, we're concerned about you, um, we want to know if there's any prayer concerns you'd like us to lift up or if anything's happening in your life that we can help with, help you, help you um, resolve a problem or help you celebrate a joy. So um, until next week, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you and grant you God's peace. Amen. <laughs>